hear five minutes from each group, and then we can do some Q&A. Starting from our left, we have Woke and Wasteless, Elena and Lyle, right here. Next up, we have Shay from Heirs to Our Ocean, uh, and Ruth from Save the Albatross Coalition. And right on the end on the right, we have Sheila from Clean Water Action. So how do you guys feel? We want to go first? Okay, yeah. Give us a little idea of who you are, what you're working on. Um. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Layal. Um, and so Elena and I, we run an Instagram platform to kind of highlight the issues around waste. Um, we're both um, zero wasters, as we are called. Um, I don't, who here has heard of the zero waste lifestyle, zero waste mentality? Oh, awesome. Yay. Um, so basically, we're a bunch of folks that uh, really do f see the power in um, reducing our plastic usage as well as reducing the waste that we produce. Um, we have found it, especially as people of color, that it's important to highlight the issues that impact people of color within that. So deepening the zero waste conversation into connecting it into over consumerism, mass production, how colonization and slavery has actually been a part of making issues like the albatross possible. Um, plastic is an unnatural thing that was created by man, and it was created by man through the facilitation of oppressing other people. So that for me feels very important, um, and so we're really excited to be here. That also want to say that if you guys are feeling a little bit depressed, we are too, so we're here with you all. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll just add that we're um, organizers, and so part of our work as having an online platform is just to reach people, but also that we organize here in Oakland and in Berkeley. And, and so we do a lot of um, like different campaigns and different work. And so we're sort of trying to fold those things together. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Shay. I'm 14 years old. And I'm from Airs to Our Oceans. So we are a youth leadership organization. We're composed of youth ages 9 to 17. And we're youth-led. We're all dedicated to protecting and preserving our waters. We have chapters in Palau, in Guam, and in the US. I myself am the youth leader of the Pescadero Public School chapter. And we will present at events. We do beach cleanups. We make changes in our daily lives to try to reduce our waste. And we try to spread the message of awareness and conservation of our environment and get youth involved with the conservation movement. I think it's so important to have youth, kids like me, caring about this and active in fighting these issues because we're the next generation. We're going to inherit this planet and we need to be thinking about these issues and we need to be ready for them when we're adults. Great, hi, I'm Ruth. I'm with uh, Zero Waste USA, which is a national affiliate of the Zero Waste International Alliance. It, which is a worldwide uh, collaboration of groups um, all over the world that are working with communities, individuals, and businesses to promote zero waste. And we are part of a co coalition called the Save the Albatross Coalition, which was formed about three years ago uh, with Captain Charles Moore, who founded the Great Pacific Garbage Gyre, and um, as a way to really do a grassroots approach to plastic pl pollution reduction, eliminating plastic pollution. And a lot of big NGOs spend a lot of money, spend a lot of advertising. Um, he felt as though we could really work with in coalition and talk with grassroots groups and do grassroots action to uh, reduce plastic pollution. So we uh, sponsor and support both uh, local and state legislation. We had a bill in the legislature connect the cap, which was to connect the bottle cap to the plastic bottle. Uh, we support the local foodware ordinances that have gone into effect, including the one in Alameda, which is a single-use plastic ban. Restaurants can't distribute single-use plastics, including straws, clamshells, and that sort of thing. So where there's a start. And in Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, a lot of other communities around the state are working on improving their um, ordinances. Hey, um, I'm Sheila Islam. I um, am the racial justice organizer at Clean Water Action. Um, and yeah, kind of along what you were saying, um, well, first of all, everybody on this panel is amazing, and I'm really like honored to be here. <laughs> um, yeah, um, Clean Water Action um, is 
um, one of the main organizations that was a part of passing the Clean Water Act. Um, we have a program called Rethink Disposable, which is right now working in Alameda with um, the zero waste ordinance that they have right now. Um, and um, part of that is, well, a big part of that is doing outreach to um, local businesses and figuring out ways which they could stop their um, disposable um, or single use items. Um, so they give them a stipend to make the transition from having single use items to reusable items. Um, but besides like my work, um, this is like an issue that's really important to me. Um, yeah, uh, I also used to work before Clean Water Action, I worked for a zero waste company, so I really got to see, um, like literally I would be in dumpsters full of plastic, um, like sorting things out and seeing how much people would use specifically after events. Um, and this is a thing that I've just, you know, in, in seeing our disposable like culture have really come to care about. Um, yeah, and also like as being a person of color, realizing in every single step of like plastic pr like production from like the extraction with oil and gas um, to like bottling facilities, like it, it affects communities of color more than anyone else. Um, and that for me is like another really main driver of like why I'm involved with this movement um, and why this is like particularly important to me. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess the one question that's coming up for me, and I feel like I'm, I would like for us to just explore the theme, is um, the theme of who's to blame. I think that this, just because we watched this movie and everybody in this room is like, fuck, we suck, you know? So I, I like a meeting where you guys are at, and I want us to maybe discuss who's to blame. Yeah. This is actually something I've been struggling with ever since I kind of became aware of how damaged our planet really is. You know, you before my moment of enlightenment, I guess, when I really started to delve into these topics and learn about plastic pollution, about climate change, about how threatened our natural world and we humans really are, I just kind of walked around, I lived, I didn't really see it. And now that I've learned about these issues, I feel so obligated to do something and at the same time, you know, I'm, I'm 14. I, I, I want to be a kid. I want to worry about school and worry about my social life and worry about my dogs. But seeing these problems, I, I have to do something. I, I can't just sit there. And I've really been grappling with blaming myself, thinking about, you know, all the plastic I've unknowingly used. What if that straw I used ended up in a sea turtle's brain? You know, that's something I've been fighting with and thinking about humanity, you know, that I'm part of this species, that it's the one species that isn't working in harmony with our planet for the greater good. It's, I've, I, I've kind of come to the conclusion that blaming really at the end of the day can't be important. We can't get stuck on that. If we worry about who's to blame, we'll get stuck in the past, we'll start pointing fingers at each other, and we have to work together to solve this. There's no other way. We have to be one entity of people who care, who are working to fight this. And, you know, if we blame, we're never going to get there. So I really think it's just about solutions, helping each other, educating each other. What can we do? What do we need to know? And how we can help. And that's how I deal with it, and what I've come to think. Yeah, this is Elena speaking. Um, something that Lyle and I spoke on a different panel, and we met this person who did beach cleanups in Nicaragua or something like that. And he was describing this sort of existential moment where he's wading in the water, picking up things to, to throw away. Um, and he's talking about this toy car that he had as a child. And he used to love this toy car. He like memorized it. He knew what its tires looked like and all of that. And he's waiting in the water and he finds the tire of the exact same model of this exact same toy car that he grew up with and loved with. And so, you know, 
probably isn't the actual physical toy car, but the idea that there was thousands of them, probably millions of them manufactured. Um, and I think of myself as a young person, I really like gel pens. I don't know if you guys remember those gel pens. And I don't even know how many packs of those things I had growing up. But to think that they're all sitting on a beach somewhere or in a landfill somewhere. So the question of who to blame, I mean, was it me for loving gel pens as a 14-year-old, as a 10-year-old? No, not necessarily. Um, I'm not going to go out and buy a pack now, but I think about the corporations that are to blame, and I think about sort of the individual decisions that we have and how powerful we are as individuals. Um, I think about bringing access to people, having people access to contraceptive care, to abortions, to have less children if they so choose to it, so that there's not as many people on the planet, right? That's, that's a way, an act of environmental justice, of environmental action, in the way that you're like moving through the world, whether it's your straws or your disposability things or your gel pens, but the way that you think about and interact with everything that's going in your life um, isn't really a how, who's to blame, but also an internal discussion of how do we now negotiate and manage the situation that we have, which is a lot of death and destruction. These birds, they didn't die in honor, right? Those deaths weren't honorable. I believe in the life cycle that death comes and goes, but those, that seemed robbed from them. Um, and the anger that the movie invokes makes me want to think, yeah, I want to blame somebody, but actually it's far more complicated than that. Any questions from the audience? Um, I want to um, kind of bring up a point, because someone said about how the use of plastic and toxins affect people and people of color and the deep word of racism. And they had, I'm just going to mention this, I'm degenerate, I look at TV some, and they had a story on about uh, somebody calling the police on a little girl because she was selling bottled water. And I thought, this has multiple stories. It looks flatly like racism, but it's m it has more angles. And I, um, I wanted to bring it back to you about how you bring up the issue that the use of plastics and clean water and how we work with things is another way of addressing racism and the oppressiveness of how things affect people. Thank you. Um, so, like you could think of things like Flint. Um, where a community of color was just like completely abandoned um, and still has to rely on bottled water to have a clean source of water. Um, and like ahead of this, just because I'm like, I, I know some things about like plastic pollution and I have my own like thoughts and like have written papers about environmental racism. So like I know some, but like I was reading about that ahead of this and um, like water bottle companies, specifically lobby um, elected officials to not have them fix infrastructure so that communities of color can be like stay dependent on bottled water. Um, it's like a, a thing that they do. Yes, yeah. So um, I I think like and even like water bottling facilities, um, they're in communities of color. They, like, they have high cancer rates. Um, just the ways in which, like, it's, like, the number one factor in whether you're going to be affected by, like, contaminated water, soil, or air is your race. Um, if you're not a white person, you're more likely to be in an area that has contam contaminated soil, air, or water. Um, it's, like, there's no really, for me, disentangling all of that, and for me, the environmental crisis started with colonization. Um, when, you know, people's lands and resources were taken from them. That, for me, is the beginning of the environmental crisis. Um, so yeah, I, I, I like hear what you're saying about it being like 
a lot, there's a lot of lines. Um, but I ultimately like feel like, I don't, the like, yeah, it's just they're like very connected, um, race and um, environmental issues. It's like, there's so many ways in which they intersect, yeah. <clears throat> well, for me, like, we have to kind of go back to kind of understand how s focusing solely on plastic. We are in, in July, which is a Plastic Free July campaign. Um, and so I'm just going to focus on plastic since we just watched that. Although I feel like with environmental justice, water, air, land, soil, everything, access to nature, it could, it could be a whole dissertation. Not that I care to write one, but it could be. <laughs> Um, so solely with plastic, if you look at that as a, so a resource that has been sold, um, it's required the extraction um, economy. Ha and the extraction economy it has been a very strategic placement uh, in order to profit people at the top. You know, after Occupy Movement, I feel like the narrative of the 99% became very popular. Um, and so if you look at the extractive model, you have people who have access to wealth or who want to make a profit that go into places to take a raw material to then manufacture it, produce it, and sell it. Um, and then we, like I feel you on the, I'm 14, I feel very responsible, but I feel like we don't come in till the very short end of that whole cycle. Um, and when I look at race across the board, raw material extraction is in communities of color. And they're not happening in Africa, only in Africa or in China or in South America. They're literally happening here in California. You look at the Central Valley. The, we have extracted so much water from the Central Valley. The agricultural companies, again, not us, have extracted so much water for packaging, for growth of food, for whatever it is, that they have lost 20 feet of soil. So they're actually lowering topsoil, 20 feet of topsoil, um, because they have underwater um, watersheds, and I think that's what they call it, aquapond, aquifers. Um, and so if you, if you look at that, we have in the extractive model, we go into communities, we extract oil, for example, for the plastics, then we ship them somewhere else to get processed, which a lot of the processing that happens here in the United States is in New Orleans, is in Louisiana, where the biggest petrochemical facilities are. And people there have high rates of cancer, high rates of asthma, and that's just for plastic. So, and it, it's very strategic. It's being extracted in indigenous communities. It's being sent to predominantly black communities where it's being it's being purified, and then it's sent to a factory somewhere in the Midwest where there's a lot of poor people who need factory jobs to process it and then redistribute it. This is not an accident. This has been strategic from the beginning. And that is why it's important, especially when looking at, I'm very critical of the zero waste movement. Yeah, buy your bamboo toothbrush, buy your bulk bags. Please, please do that. Feel empowered as an individual to make daily choices in your life. But the reality is you need to deepen the narrative. You're not just doing it because you want to feel good or because you want to you know, uh, uh, support a green economy. You're doing it because you really want to abolish racism. And you're doing it because you want to have better jobs for people. And you're doing it because you believe in a better world and a regenerative economy as most folks like to call it. And I suggest y'all Google it because there's so much good information about the regenerative economy. Um, and so I, I think that at the center of what we want to move towards is actually valuing individuals, valuing livelihood, and getting back in sync with the ecosystem. And that is going to require us to kind of move away from this extractive economy because it is rooted in racism and it's rooted in the subjectivity of other people. So that's kind of like my, my little understanding of how it's all connected. And you could look at it from any material good that you're buying. Um, and I think we have an abundant amount of things now in 2018 that we can literally shut down factories and we will be okay for a couple generations. We will be fine. 
So um, yeah, just to kind of keep deepening. And so my, my further to kind of keep it on plastic is if you're gonna go buy something, look at where it's made and then go home and Google. What's, what are the, what's the political and social stuff happening in that country? What are people doing that's good? What are people doing that ba that's bad? Again, continue making deeper connections to our plastic consumption problem. Um, I, I just want to say, I think that's sort of important to tie back to the whole issue of blame. You know, we can't blame people, but I think it's really important to hold corporations accountable because, you know, I am not a person of color, but I can see that it's a clear factual truth that plastic manufacturing corporations, fossil fuel corporations will systemically destroy and abuse communities of color or communities with a low socioeconomic status. And while, again, we can't you know, blame each other as individuals, I think we have to hold corporations accountable for that. And I think we have to be aware of what they're doing and be aware of our choices when we purchase and when we vote. Thank you all very much for, for being here tonight. <clears throat> I found this an, an, an amazing movie, very, very powerful. And um, I had known about the garbage patch in the Pacific, the gyre, for at least three or four years, at least three or four years now. But I think part of the power of the movie is that it brings it down very concretely to a single species of animal, which are clearly beautiful and have as much right to be on the planet and to live and have a, you know, a natural life as any of, any of a human do. I'm curious, do any of you know how long have uh, scientists known about this problem of ingestion of plastic and its effect on the uh, albatross? And are there other species that we now know are being affected in similar ways? So I'm not an albatross or um, scientist, but I, a, a albatross expert or a scientist, but I do know a little bit. Um, I have talked to some of the scientists at Scripps uh, Oceanography in um, Southern California, and all seabirds are affected by plastic. All seabirds, they've studied seabirds up and down of the West Coast, and all have um, plastics. Uh, maybe not as dramatically as we see with the albatross species, you know, where that's all that, you know, they're flying around and that's what they're getting and that's what they're feeding their, their babies, but um, all fish have plastic in them. Bivalves, the, you know, oysters have plastic in them and we have plastic in us. You know, it's, it's amazing that it's permeated the entire, uh, you know, world. We talk about, you know, we're now in the plastics era, plasticine era, right? It's the new plastic era well, when the geologic time goes back and invests our, you know, investigates our era. We will have just a huge layer of plastic because that's where we are. So um, it, 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 I think that one area where um, we, we really have to focus is that um, we can't all do everything. We can't all be wonderful political organizers. We can support political organizers. We can't all be beautiful photographers. We can support photographers. Uh, I saw Chris Jordan speak about this movie and somebody asked him, Chris, what should we do? What are the five things that we could do to solve this problem? And he's like, look, I'm the photographer. You know, ask somebody else. You know, I'm the photographer, I'm raising this issue. And so I think it's really so important for people who are scientists, people who are organizers, people who, you know, who are political, people who are elected to office, grassroots activists, all walks of life, we have a role to play in this. And then as individuals, you know, besides the bamboo toothbrush, you know, we have the responsibility to be informed and to be informed about those deeper issues that, um, you know, these wonderful people are talking about, so. That's the best I can do. <laughs> do you want to go first? Yeah, um, you know, it's an interesting, interesting, you started speaking about the gyre, the Pacific North, what is the Pacific gyre? And um, I recently learned that there's five of them, actually, in almost every ocean. So, and they're almost just as big. The Pacific is the biggest one, but it's also the biggest body of water. Um, 
And a few weeks ago, a few months ago, we were out in the ocean um, looking for seaweed and, and we were out there talking to different scientists and, and um, herbalists and things like that. And we were just talking about microplastics, like where are these microplastics and, and are they in the seaweed, which they're not, but <laughs> we, were, we had the question. Um, all of our food sources in the ocean have plastics in them. So your question around, you know, are there other species that are being affected? Definitely. And like, who knows about it? Where's this information localized? Like we are a big planet and there's so many areas where plastics have found their way. It's even in the deep sea. There, I was reading something or watching a video and somebody told, somebody was speaking that they went to a unknown like human location in the deep, deep ocean, as far as anyone could have ever gone, there were already plastics there. Like plastic is everywhere. And so the effects that we're seeing on, um, on our creatures are in this case really visible because it, you know we had the photographer who came through and took, took the time to make the documentary about it. But also I wanna tell you a story of um, the starfish that is happening right here on the coast. If you do, do or do not know, Starfish are major predators in the ocean. They're, they hunt and they're really good at it. They like to eat, um, what is it, the purple sea urchins. Yeah, apparently sea urchins, not many people like to eat them. The purple ones, for example, that not many people like to eat them. And so when we're talking about plastic, we're talking about climate change, we also have to talk about the acidity of the ocean and how things are changing. And with that, the temperatures can rise. And as the temperatures rise, uh, viruses are more easily transmitted. So that some virus attacked these starfish predators, the population of the starfish plummets, right? And so what happens then are these sea urchins that normally get eaten by the starfish are going wild. And there's so many sea urchins that the kelp is now be effect being affected by the sea urchins because the sea urchins are eating up this one particular brand of kelp or this one type of kelp. And so, you know, that's a little longer of a, of a story and a connection between climate change and the effects of plastics and what's happening, but somebody could write a documentary on it and we would be able to see it much easier, you know? <laughs> For now, what we see are these albatross. Um, and I think that there is, I doubt that there is a species on this planet that isn't being negatively affected by, by um, all of this. And I know that scientific research has known about it for a really, really long time and that their voices have been strategically silenced um, by big oil, but also political parties who knew that if they discredit the science and they keep us obsessed on that narrative, then we will be bickering amongst ourselves around whether climate change is real or not. And so that was also a strategic move by political parties to make sure that we're thinking about other, other things, not about our plastic consumption or our oil consumption. Um, and Lael wanted to talk about humans, I believe. Yeah. Well, I, and then your question is like, I think what what is the life cycle of plastic? Does it start when you it's manufactured, when you buy it, or is it when the fossil fuel is extracted? So I kind of expand. Now I don't want to go into it too deep, but I think it's thinking through like where the like I mentioned the petrochemical facilities. How is it manufactured? How are migrant communities being impacted or exploited to make plastic production? And I. From my experience, people who live around certain facilities, they have a lower life expectancy. Um, just for example, in Fresno, the life expectancy around somebody, for example, who lives in an, in an agricultural community is 20 years less than anybody else on the state of California. So if you look at those numbers in part different areas, you might be able to get some more gain, gain some more knowledge around the, the life cycle of plastic, however you determine that. I did want to speak a little bit on how plastic impacts humans. Um, is that plastic, when it enters our system, because I care about my own species, so I've kind of tried to learn more ho about how it impacts us, is that if we eat fish, we ingest it, because the fish ingest it. When it enters our body, it mimics as an estrogen. So it starts to go through our hormone cycle, which is primarily focused on our reproductive um, organs, our reproductive, how, how we work and we produce. So this is just to kind of expand the plastic connection, is that what that is causing is, is higher levels of infertility. It's causing higher rates of miscarriages of male babies, um, and it's causing people's inability to be able to procreate and have families. Um, I think about shows like The Had Handmaid's Tale. I don't particularly watch it, but I feel like it kind of connects a little bit to that is that plastic, unfortunately, is going to affect our ability to continue as a species just through ingestion, not through production, not through chemicals that are in the air, through how it's manufactured. 
Um, and so I wanted to put that out there. Um, if you are a seafood consumer, um, if you yourself um, use plastic to heat up food in a microwave, for example, is plastic leaching does impact your hormone cycle for everybody, male and female and other types of sexes. Um, so I, I just wanted to make that connection. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, a quick mention you know, of something that wasn't brought up in the film, and it, it brought up in terms uh, by the panel a little on seafood, and that is that polyester, when you wash it, produces microplastics, and there are huge of the microplastics in the ocean, and you know over a trillion particles, and they're eaten by everything. So. Even your clothes, choice of clothes are important to have something that biodegrades like cotton or whatever, but uh, polyester is one to avoid because it, when you wash it, it goes into the bay, for instance. Thank you. Yeah. Do we have any more questions from the audience? I, I did want to say something about the Please. polyester fibers, is that I think uh, my mind automatically goes like, let's all wear 100% cotton. And for those of us who can afford and do pesticide-free cotton, organic cotton. Um, and then I and then I think about the extractive model in that I don't want to I don't want to I don't want to have to create a new economy to get out of this problem. We don't need a new product. And what's going to happen to all the clothes we've already made? Do we just dump them? Do we? What do we do? Worms aren't going to even eat them. So. Um, I think a lot about how fluorescent lights, when we realized that our energy use was so high, a lot of cities started subsidizing light bulbs that would help us as consumers. And I think the same should be with polyester fibers. Why don't we get filters and have our cities subsidize filters for our washing machines? Because I, I do believe the way that we wear clothes now is a problem, but I don't want to support a new economy so that we can have more consumed goods because that's going to that's going to cause more carbon. It's going to increase our carbon footprint. The track, logistics, travel of all that, I don't even want to think about that. So I really think about how do we also get creative with solutions in a way that doesn't create a new economy, because we don't need that. So it's not so much of a question, but a comment. Uh, how, um, I mean, yeah, we can, corporations are on fault, definitely. Um, but also it comes down to us, to me, and to everybody else. Like, you know, a bunch of times I have my water bottle, I have my coffee bottle, I get, go to get coffee and I hand them my coffee bottle and they pour it from a plastic cup to my coffee because of the germs or whatever. <laughs> uh, so I think a big part of it is education, like educating people, educating you, and thank you so much for, for doing it. Uh, how, you know, what happens to all these things that people throw out in trash and think that they just disappear in nothingness. And they don't. They, they live in our organism and in every single, single thing that lives on the planet forever. Uh, so actually, a question part of it is like, how do you talk to people? How do you inspire people? And what we as a community can do to like, what's the best way to approach people about it and talk about, like, plastic pollution without sounding like a preacher, like, oh, you can't do that. <laughs> and thank you. Uh, Elena and Kay also brought, um, brought bags uh, that they're selling on the table, so please take a look at them. Uh, reusable bags, so we don't have to, you know, fortunately, Oakland and Berkeley outload plastic bags. But all over the country, people get bags and throw them all in trash after bringing their groceries home. Uh, so yeah, how, how do we talk to about it to, to people? How do we inspire youth to use reusable stuff since all of this plastic is all around right now? Um, I, I think, I hate to say this, but it tends to be easier to get youth on board than adults. Yeah. Um, because when you talk to young people, you can tell them that birds are eating plastic and the birds are dying and the kids will care. They'll be like, oh, the poor bird, I want to save it. But when you talk to adults, their reaction is to go to, well, why should I care? 
why should I worry about this bird? And you can give them the scientific evidence that we're all connected. We all live on this planet together, and every species that goes extinct due to human action will directly affect our ability to live on this planet. But that's a complex narrative, and people don't always want to buy into it. When you talk to youth, though, generally, if you just show them what's going on, they're not going to need that whole scientific story. All they're going to need is life forms are suffering, and then they'll try to make a change. So I think with younger kids, just showing them what's going on, what's going wrong, will be enough that they'll be like, hey, mom, uh, maybe we should not straw today. It, it, you, you see it happen. You know, you see little kids telling their parents, hey, I don't, I don't want a straw, mom. I, I know I liked straws before. Now, I, I don't want one. Straws are bad. And with older kids, you can go deeper into it because once you've gotten them to care, they'll want to learn more. You can really talk to teenagers and we're capable of learning about these issues, about corporate accountability, about the scientific reasons we all depend on other species, and we're capable of thinking about it and talking about it and taking action. And that's so important, I think, for all adults to realize, is that if you just tell your kids what's going on, if you get them to care, kids will want to help and are capable of helping, and will be all the more ready for facing this crisis when they are adults with their own children whose lives they will worry about. That, um, uh, I wanted to tell the story about the City of Alameda Foodware Ordinance, which started out as a youth project. Um, Jackie Nunez from The Last Plastic Straw came and spoke to a school in Alameda, and that students got very up in arms, very activated around not only straws, but other single-use plastics. They petitioned the city council. The city council unanimously said, city staff, you need to work on this. The city staff did their bureaucratic part and said, okay, we can amend our ordinance and we can do the right thing and we can change it. And so the ordinance took effect in January, is beginning to be enforced in July. And now the students have written letters to 100 restaurants, over 600 restaurants, saying, thank you for doing your part. You have to do more. You have to comply. And they have developed, um, through Clean Water Action, the uh, Youth Ambassador Program. And they have actually gone out to uh, survey the litter in Alameda and do a brand audit and actually collect data on, is it Starbucks, is it McDonald's, is it Nestle, what is the brand that's being uh, littered, and then using these brand audits to make action. So some of the organizations that are working on these litter audits are Break Free From Plastics, which is a worldwide coalition, uh, the World Cleanup Day, September 15th, which is also Coastal Cleanup Day, will be gathering brand information that then they can use to take action um, to support and the organizations that are doing well and to encourage the organizations that are not doing as well to uh, change their behaviors. So I so agree that the spark comes from youth and, and this is just an example where you could see the immediacy of their action. Um, I don't, I personally, um, like, I have a problem with, like, relying on youth, <laughs> um, because we still have, like, generations of people who are of voting age making decisions, um, and it is ultimately the parents that have the buying power, um, and I feel like a lot of education is focused on youth, um, like especially like environmental education. Uh, and that's amazing, but I think a lot of effort should be put in educating um, older generations. And I mean, that's something that I haven't really um, seen done a lot. It's a thing that I care about a lot because, you know, it's the old, like I said, the older generations that have the buying power and like the decision-making power and like, can vote. Um, and, and I personally, like, like my mom 
grew up in Mexico, like in a ranch where they burned their trash. She like doesn't understand items that like don't work in harmony with nature. Like that, she just doesn't understand that like burning plastic is toxic. Um, not that she like burns plastic here in California, but <laughs> or that's how she disposes of it. But just like in talking to my mom about that, um, she's just like became really receptive and like telling her like, oh, like that's made out of this. Like you don't want that. Like and letting her know. And, and not that like every single adult is gonna be that receptive. Um, yeah, I, I, I just like also like have like an issue with like just relying on youth because there's so much that needs to be done um, that like older generations need to be educated and also like ignited as well. Um, yeah, that's what I had to say about <laughs> Sorry, can I go off of that? Uh, I totally agree with you. Older generations definitely need to be educated and have be sparked. I mean, it's the older generations who can vote, who do ultimately make the purchasing decisions, who drive the cars. But, you know, you say that there's a lot of education going into youth, but personally, I don't think there's enough. At my school, I have a chapter of heirs, and we just got a system in place where we will no longer use plastic utensils. We have reusable metal ones now, and we got a composting system in place for our school cafeteria's food waste. Before that heirs chapter, we didn't get really any environmental education. I mean, there was one science teacher who tried, but you talk to most of the kids at my school, quite frankly, before heirs, and they didn't know what climate change was. And the community I live in is a community of agricultural workers. And most of the kids and their parents do not have the time or resources to educate themselves about these issues in their own time. They just can't do it. And the public school educational system wasn't giving those kids what they needed. They, they didn't know. They, the issue wasn't even on their radar. And I think that can't happen. We can't have kids going through school not knowing about climate change, not knowing that plastic is an issue. That's unacceptable. And it's so important to educate adults and empower adults. And I agree with that completely, that they do ultimately have that decision-making power. But we can't assume that youth are getting all of it or getting all they need. And we shouldn't be relying on youth, but youth are the future. And I think we need to be focusing on educational systems, making sure they're giving youth with less resources education while they are in school. And I think we need to be aware that really there isn't as much youth awareness around this issue as there may seem to be. I, I'll speak kind of briefly. Um, is I, I think when it comes to how do you educate anybody on anything, I think you should just ask yourself, how would you like to be educated on something that you have no idea about? Especially in things of high tension, politics, economics, social construction, and just really reflect on how would you like somebody to talk to you? And I doubt you would want somebody to yell at you or tell you, why did you bring me a straw when I told you not to bring me one? I'm sure you would want somebody to say, well, I'm sad you brought this to me this time, but just so you know, there's so many of them or whatever. And while I'm talking about straws, I would just kind of put that as an overarching answer. And while we're talking about straws, there's been so much emphasis on the plastic straw ban recently um, that there has been a response, a very kind response from people in the disability community who have said, this is quite ridiculous that you guys are gonna ban a tool that we have relied on and that was literally created for us to be able to drink beverages. Um, straws were created through the medical industrial complex in order to provide services or a tool for people who are not able to drink out of a cup. Um, so I just wanted to add that as a complication when plastic straws are like 0.04% of trash in the oceans and actually like 48% of the trash in the oceans are like nets. 
Um, and then speaking a little bit about what you were saying about how you go and you get a beverage out of your own cup and they pour it out of a plastic cup, I think that instead of us focusing on education, although it is important, I think that infrastructure is very is is equally as important. If restaurants actually cared or coffee shops actually cared about plastic pollution, which Starbucks is seeming like they care, although I think it's ridiculous that now they're going to create a whole separate production of lids, but whatever. Um, that if 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 a business actually cared that the infrastructure should be there. How about providing a sink that is regulated by our food and administrative department that then gets certified as a, a sink that has good soap, good way of washing your cups, so that then you can hand it, wash it yourself when you walk in, hand it over to the counter to put your coffee, and then it could stay within regulation of how they are managing that. Because a lot of the responses I get when I bring my own cutlery or when I bring anything of myself to a restaurant or cafe is this actually breaks our food um, administrative department regulation. We can't bring stuff from outside of the kitchen back to the kitchen, which I totally understand. And I think there could be some investment on in infrastructure on how to be able to sterilize our I items up to code, although I have my own thoughts about the code, but up to code in order for our service, for our, our cups to be used or our plates or whatever. So I think there's not enough talk on infrastructure and we focus on the particular problem. And again, I think this is why Woke and Wasteless even exists because we really want to continue deepening the narratives that we're talking about with waste and more than that to inspire people to think creatively of solutions because we're not going to get out of this mess without thinking creatively. Yeah, and um, I, I do agree that youth are important to organize and to educate and to learn from, um, as are people in voting age. And the other piece are our elders, right? Our elders, a lot of them were, depending on how old they are, are around before plastic was mass produced. So they have a wealth of knowledge and information. And so to breach this conversation of like, let's talk about it, it's like, cool, what was life like before plastic? Tell me about Tupperware that was all glass, that's not Pyrex, that is everything else, you know? or. Um, uh, do you mind if I tell a story about your grandmother's uh, medical kit? Oh. Yeah, so um, uh, we had the honor to go through some of Lael's grandmother's things, and she being somebody in the community who often um, supported people in their, their like general health and wellness, she had this really amazing kit um, in like an old tin that was... Um, all glass syringes, which we've actually looked for them online, they're really hard to find, and the ones that are around are super expensive and all manufactured in China. So we open it up, and it's this beautiful, like, there's two of them, one of them was broken, and just the real... Which she kept around in an emergency, so right. if the one that was not broken could, couldn't be used, which yeah. I think that's pretty cool. Right? How zero waste is that? Like, there's all these ingenious ways. My own grandmother saved everything. Um, you know, I, I was so accustomed to using um, old yogurt containers and things like that that I really, I understand, like, having shame around it of, like, walking into a restaurant with your old yogurt container, but I never really knew it because my grandmother taught me that it was fine because she was an environmentalist. Um, so there's also a wealth of information that our elders can teach us um, and each other. You know, we, we, the cool thing about our platform is our friends and random people are always coming up to us asking questions and it's just an open, honest dialogue. Like, well, I don't know, what do you do? You know, <laughs> people ask us all the time, like, what do you do with your waste that's in your bathroom? And we can tell them, but also, what do you do? You know, what, what creative ways and innovative ways are you thinking up of? Great, do we have maybe one or two more questions? It's not exactly a question. One thing I want to say is that RISE is going to be coming up, and that's the, a, a climate conference that's happening in September, and it's um, Climate Action Jobs and Justice. And I invite everyone to look at that, and step forward in time when they can to participate. And um, I wanted to say that I think sometimes the, the thing that strikes um, adults or elders and stuff is how it affects their health because they're feeling it. They, that a lot of people have different kinds of maladies with their health and when you tell them this situation with plastic is affecting you, that sometimes is a hook that makes them say, I don't want that. So I'm throwing that in the mix, thank you. Thank you. One more question? All right. 
then we'll wrap it up for tonight. Uh, one comment, I read a study, they were um, working with children, not children, youth, uh, trying to convince their, them to change their mind about some topic. And they found that it was much more effective if they told the youth this story in a way that showed that they were being lied to by the authorities, by the, either the state or corporations. They were much more likely to change their behavior if they were uh, told they were being lied to and they were being ripped off. Thank you. I did want to say, I know I've been talking a lot, but I like talking, so I'm just going to keep going. <laughs> um, I, with the question around what you were saying about going and get your coffee and that, and as well as how do we talk to people about plastic, one of the things that feels really important for me with Woke and Oasis is to, is to support local businesses. If we stop relying on mass production and big, big companies that um, are producing a lot of materials, it feels kind of like in the clouds, like it's unreachable. How do we get Walmart to stop selling tires, for example? That's a bad example, but it, it feels more like you gotta climb more ladders to get there. But if we really invest, even if it costs us a dollar more, two dollars when we go out and buy things in local businesses, we're really pulling the power from the top down and empowering our own local economy as well as um, gaining more control. Because it's easier to go to your local coffee shop and organize the, lo the people who regularly attend to try to get the owner to stop using plastic cups, for example, than it is to get like Starbucks. Because people have been after Starbucks about plastics for a while. The, the whole audits were actually started to try to get Coca-Cola and Starbucks to be more accountable to their manufacturing. So I just want to say that if you have the option and you can afford to support local businesses instead of shopping at big companies, I would say please do so because a lot of folks can't, and especially some folks who are in communities of color and low-income communities cannot afford the extra dollar a month. Um, please support your local economies. That way we can bring the power back down and we can start making change faster because as the albatross are teaching us, we don't have a lot of time. Uh, yeah, I have more of a um, comment of how this film was made and, and how it's meant for distribution. Uh, first of all, the director, Chris Jordan, uh, made the film and then he decided not to be selling it as a commercial product. Um, so it's open for distribution, so if anybody wants to watch it, uh, it's uh, available online and also you can screen it uh, on the website. Just go to the website, there's a lot of interesting stories about how it's made. Um, and you can just let them know, download the film from the website and show it at the, your local organization or with your friends uh, whatsoever. Also, the way they made it is really interesting for me. Uh, he hired several groups of, I think, two groups of editors who edited the film, and then uh, he didn't like it, he didn't like the second version, so finally he threw it all away and sat down with his friend and edited it by himself because he wanted to show it like from the point of view of the albatross and like not really mm, uh, like regular editing techniques. So that's how the film was created. Uh, uh -huh. Yeah, they, they've, they've been there, I believe, eight times on the Midway Island. So they had lots and lots of footage and it was really confusing to go through. Um, yeah, but I encourage everybody to show it uh, to your all community. I think it's a very powerful film and I think, you know, that's what can make people realize like how this plastic affects the ocean, like something that most of us don't really see on an everyday basis, like how all this plastic gets accumulated in the ocean and creates islands of plastic as such. Uh, so yeah, just my little two cents, and is there any other more questions? I will just add, um since we are a social media platform. If you have Instagram, follow us on Woke and Wasteless. Um, and then if you want, we're gonna be over by our table over there with these um, bags that were mentioned earlier. On the back, they have lines for, if you go to the bulk store and you don't know like, oh, I have a 12 ounce jar at home, but I wanna like, I don't know how much that is in my bag. They're estimations, but we have lines on the back to help you out. Cause there's many a times when I've been at the bulk store, my bag got like this much of my snacks and my bags or my jar is only that big. <laughs> Brilliant, thanks so much. And actually, if we could continue down the line and you guys could just remind us um, 
who you know who you're with and what events you have coming up and just remind the audience and if you have anything else to say to that to start yeah um we're woke and wasteless we're actually going to be down in venice uh what's the date august 9th august 9th um for another panel and discussion um and then do we have anything else coming up we're, we're having a panel and discussion on venice beach around it's called woke and wasteless it's a zero waste panel for exclusively for people of color panelists, but everybody's welcome, as well as um, hopefully we will have some folks from the disability community speaking about how plastics impacts them. Um, and it is an open event. It's a collaboration with Greenpeace, When She Rises, and Spark LA. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Shay, I'm from Air Store Oceans. Um, as far as events, we have a lot of members and Almost all of us present at different events, attend different events, speak at different events, educate. So there are always events coming up. I don't really know of any specific because generally the only ones I know about are the ones that I'm invited to speak at. But you can email us, info at airstoroceans.com uh, if you are interested in having us present somewhere. We will pay for the transportation and speak at a school or table or presented in events, and you can visit our website, www.airstoceans.com, for more information. Uh, we're based out of the Bay Area, uh, San Francisco-ish, and we've got a founding air chapter of about 15 members. Great. Uh, and uh, our organization is Zero Waste USA. It's at zerowasteusa.org. And we have the Albatross Coalition, which is albatrosscoalition.org. And uh, we, we work to train folks in zero waste communities, zero waste businesses. We're going to be having a zero waste business training up in Arcata, August 3rd. And one of the things that we're doing to support um, grassroots organizations is to host zero waste curious events. And uh, we'd probably love to have you guys there, one of those, um, to explain to folks, what does it really mean to be zero waste? When you say zero, do you really mean zero? And do I have to be like a really big zero waster in order to make effect? No, everybody can make a difference. So we work with um, the Ecology Center, the local Sierra Clubs, other organizations to support them in their work. And um, we are promoting World Cleanup Day on September 15th. And so all going out there, picking up litter and quantifying the brands. Yeah, I'm Sheila Islam, I'm with Clean Water Action. Um, the main thing that I'm working on right now is the People's Climate March in September, the um, rise that you were talking about. Um, yeah, and the other big thing that I'm working on is getting um, Bay Area um, elected officials to declare a climate emergency. We got Berkeley to declare a climate emergency um, and state that they were gonna stop um, fossil fuel infrastructure. Um, so, if you live in the Bay Area, let your local elected officials know you want them to declare a climate emergency and join um, Berkeley's town hall um, to talk about ways in which the Bay Area collectively can address climate change. Thank you all very much. If we can have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you all for coming. Again, this is hosted by Liberated Lens, liberatedlens.org. We encourage you all to come to our future screenings. And we've got uh, the table over here and uh, some things to hand out. So feel free to hang out, chat amongst each other, and we're going to start putting the room back together the way it was if you've got an extra hand. Thank you all very much.